Um, it, it's, it's great to be here, and I think um, Michael talked about the Lockheed Declaration, and to some extent he used that phrase about a shift in paradigm. And I think um, one of the things that, that the public... Um, suffers from in terms of things like G8s and summits is that we want the big hurrah and we want everything tied up in a box with a pink ribbon on it and this is what we've delivered. And what was very different about this G8 is that it, it, it's actually, it's not delivered anything yet, but what it's done is it's shifted the direction in which things will go. And, and for those of us who are kind of involved in, in the discussions and, and have campaigned and been engaged around development for years and years and years, we, I think it's only beginning to sink in just how important <laughs> that G8 was in terms of shifting that, that agenda, even if to the public out there there's not a kind of massive, you know, it's not like there's a, there's a pledge or there's big loads of, shed loads of money or whatever. But you guys probably don't need me to explain to you some of the connections between tax and, and aid and, and development. But I'll just give you a figure in terms of if you, Christian Aid has done some research over the years, you know we've been working on this for about five years, and we estimate that it's about $160 billion a year that's lost in terms of tax revenue to developing countries. Now, you know, that's equivalent to the entire global aid budget. So one of the big transformation questions for us about the G8 is that, yes, of course, aid is important, but actually it signals to us something that goes beyond aid, Something that says, if we can get the structures right, then we actually are talking about a much more just global economy rather than countries being dependent upon large S. And that's a very significant shift and a very significant challenge for us in the development community. <coughs> and it's also something that relates to Christian Aid's own agenda in terms of trying to tackle the structural causes of poverty as well as responding to the immediate needs. I think there's something really significant there. But as Michael and indeed Lee have indicated, there is much more work to be done. Um, so we have started, we've kind of like shifted the agenda, but we need to have a clear roadmap ahead. And we have got a certain degree of roadmaps, um, plans, action plans, or commitments. I think where <laughs> we're lacking is in some respects some timetabling, some kind of real focus down, and, um, and, and some specific issues which I'll come back to. One of the things that was very important for us, I think, as NGOs, was you know th there's a lot of concern about to what extent G8s have any kind of credibility anymore. You know, has G8 has the G8 got legitimacy? Well, I think on this issue and, and the issues around this particular G8, and particularly tax, it was incredibly important that the G8 actually took the steps they did because it's about putting our own house in order. If the G8 hadn't have taken the kind of steps that they've taken around tax in particular, but some other issues too, to some extent, no other country's going to do it, and those issues are mm. never going to be resolved. So it's almost like a domino effect that Britain was able, and Britain, who is, it has to be said, uh, one of the worst performing jurisdictions in terms of information <laughs> collection and, and, and tax havens and all that kind of stuff. You know, we've got to put our own house in order. So that's why it was so significant for us. Um, so a couple of things around putting our own house in order. Overseas territories and crown dependencies, tax havens to, to, to the most of us. We do recognise that there's a complexity there. They all have different jurisdictions and constitutional realities. Um, and there has been a very significant step forward. The declaration does take us forward in, in a new area. But I think there's a very specific need for timetable. And there's also, I think for us, we want to be able to see that, that actually those overseas territories and crown dependencies are signing up as well. Um, another issue around this principle of beneficial ownership, which Lee thankfully explained, really important that those principles are highlighted in, in the declaration so that we're able to kind of push on that, which again changes the, the dynamic. And this issue about accessing information, it's really, really key. You know, that, that, old, knowledge, that old adage of information and knowledge is power. If you're a developing country, you don't even know what the level of, of engagement is and the level of kind of tax abuse or tax of dodging takes place. And to some extent, we've seen that over the last year in the UK itself. The, the public anger that exists around the likes of the, if you like, the Google and the Starbucks phenomena has been about people, people realising that 
these are companies that they thought were acting fairly and justly and actually aren't. So that level of knowledge taps in and really enables people. As you would expect from an organisation like Christian Aid, we are particularly concerned about what this all means for developing countries. To hear the, the uh, speeches from, from David Cameron, to read the, the, the declaration and the communique in particular, um, the language connecting tax and international development is absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's amazing. I, you know, if you'd have said to me a year ago, you were going to see this, I'd have laughed in your face. You know, the reality is this is incredibly way, uh, an incredible acknowledgement that tax isn't just a domestic issue, it's a global issue and we need to tackle it globally. But we need to tackle it globally with developing countries. We, can't, we don't want to see, um, you know, to be fair, an OECD, G20 stitch up. We want to actually see developing countries really engaged. I'm very pleased to hear what, what Lee has said, although we'd want to push it further. There is the question of capacity. Um, as Michael said, the, the, the scale of it is really significant. So I just want to share with you a quick statistic that if we were to expect from, say, sub-Saharan Africa itself to have the same level of administrative capacity as the OECD countries have got, as the OECD average, we'd need to find and train an extra 680,000 tax officials. So that's even just to bring sub-Saharan Africa up to the level that we have normally within OECD countries. So that, that's the scale of the, of, the, of the challenge that's ahead of us. And so, you know, we really need to think about what that means. But it's not just a question of that capacity. It's also about how that capacity is defined. We don't want it to be just defined in very narrow kind of administrative ways. It needs to be seen as a wider kind of approach, really. And again, it's not just about the side of the developing countries increasing their capacity. It's also about, well, what are the systems, what are the processes on both sides that need to facilitate that kind of capacity being less, um, being less necessary. And obviously there's a, a question in terms of um, we welcome the OECD G20 reform of the international tax rules, but it's really important that, the res that those processes are resourced properly, and particularly things like the, the UN Tax Committee, which uh, has a very small number of people, you know, to what extent the processes are really resourced. The other, one of the, thanks, Two things I want to say finally, as, as an, from an NGO perspective and an organisation that's been working on tax for a long, long time, about five years or so, is that on one hand, we have the technical stuff about you know, fiscal policy, beneficial ownership transfer pricing, um, and the kind of conversations that Lee has at parties. But on the other hand, we have a much more fundamental question about how we view society. There is, uh, certainly within Christian Aid strategy, yes, there's stuff about dealing with the regulation, dealing with the legal issues, but there's also something about what are the norms, what are the attitudes, what are the ethics behind tax? Is tax, you know, we talk about death and taxes as if, you know, it's, it's a necessary piece of medicine that you have to hold your nose to have while you swallow the pills or swallow the medicine. Actually, tax is a physical manifestation of our commitment to the common good. Tax is how we demonstrate the kind of world that we want to have that takes us beyond ourselves into a community approach. And for Christian aid and for people of faith, that's why they were involved in the tax campaign over the last five years. It's why we were involved in really pushing to have tax and structural issues at the heart of the IF campaign that put the kind of pressure that it did on government to make sure that tax was not only on the agenda of the G8, but actually achieve some of the things that it did. We set our agenda last year in, in the height of the, uh, of the Olympics and setting gold, silver and bronze standards for the kind of things, the outputs that we wanted to see. And actually, by and large, we hit gold in all areas except one. Um, and we, were, we know how much more the work is to be done and we will be holding government to account, particularly around public registries, we really want to be pushing forward on that, around how civil society can be involved properly so that this isn't just um, a kind of an, an elites talking to elites, but how communities and ordinary people can hold their governments to account. And also around looking at specific timetables, particularly around the overseas territories and the Crown dependencies. But it is an amazing start. The genie is out of the bottle. We have to make sure that we can't 
that we don't put the stopper back in. <laughs>